I met Viktor Frankl uh, for the first time in books, which I liked very much, and then for the first time live in his lectures at the Polyclinic in Vienna. And I found his lectures very intriguing, attractive, and I went there with my girlfriend, which now is my wife, and we had lots of discussions after this uh, presentation, these lectures. And my wife, who studied physics, uh, understood him very well, and what I understood provoked a lot of critique in me. So this was our beginning, and then she explained me how she sees it. She's very mathematical, and she understood quite well. And so this was my beginning, and my first uh, closer encounter with him was when I raised a question about paradoxical intention, and he screamed at me and didn't give me an answer, and then I stopped going into his lectures. And I came to the end of my study in psychology, I wanted to write a dissertation on logotherapy. I asked him, and, uh, and he said, well, very nice, I will support you. Call me, please, in three weeks when I'm back from a uh, lecture journey. I called him after three weeks, and he was very aggressive and said, what do you think? I don't have the time with all the students, with all their questions. Read my books and write your thesis. I wrote another thesis. Then it happened that my plan for the future did not work anymore. I wanted to work in California in a, specific, in a, a very high-ranked institution and it was not possible and I was, I remained at home and had no other plan. And then I remembered that Frankl said, there is a clinic in Germany where they practice logotherapy. I went there and uh, this was not possible that I could work there. But I got the information that there is a World Congress, the second World Congress for logotherapy in Connecticut. So I decided to go there and to present. Frankl wasn't there because he was sick. I came home, I was the only one from Austria. I called him and said, you are certainly interested how this was. And he said, oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for informing me. Could you do me a favor? Could you come to, to my lecture and speak an hour about some presentations which you heard? I did that. And from then on, he was in enthusiastic about me. He, he invited me the same evening to his house and, uh, and uh, he wanted to, to work together and uh, his daughter started to run an institute in Vienna and he asked me, he came into my student's uh, apartment to ask me if I want, if I would be willing to, to work with the daughter and so on. And so I did. We started the institute, and after a couple of months, I said, this is not enough, we have to have a training. And so I started the training in logotherapy and extensional analysis. And from then on, I was in constant contact, even in the development of the training, we did it with Frankl and so, and I was invited by him and by his daughter and his son-in-law and the, that family. And for 10 years, we have been in a close contact every day, almost every day, by phone. I have been very often in his house or we met in some places. We did even journeys together and, and so. And we had, he called me his right hand. He called me, you are, since Paul Pollack, a former psychiatrist who already died, you are the best friend I have. I only had Paul and now I have you. You are my connection to the world because he lived only in his apartment. He didn't go much into the town. I invited him. Once I, I, I really uh, asked him to accompany me to go to the Freud house, which was a great step for him. And of course, he came there. They were 
really astonished. Frank, he comes to the front. And, but, and so I connected him quite a lot with the world. This is my story with Frankl and uh, uh, his, uh, when uh, the, the grandchild, the daughter grandchild uh, came to confirmation. My wife was invited to be the godmother of her and, and so we had very close personal relationship. Uh, we were on the mount in the mountains together and so. And uh, something connected us very much. Frankl always liked to, to tell jokes. And he had a sport to find the appropriate joke to each situation, which is to apply self-distance somehow. And he knew many jokes, a hundred, maybe two hundred, I don't know. And he and he could tell them so brilliantly, and I could laugh. And he laughed my laughing. And I had the weakness, I couldn't memorize the jokes. So he could talk them again and again, and I could laugh as for the first time, again and again. So this was something which he really loved, and I also loved, it was very entertaining. It happened that we made, I made developments in, in logotherapy at that time and existential analysis. And uh, then uh, when, with the development of the PEA method with uh, applying more uh, individual self-experience in the training, uh, with in, in this uh, working with biography, some other colleagues like Kolbe forced that issue. And so Frankl came up and said, this is no more my logotherapy. I withdraw my honorary presidency from the society and uh, you uh, and, and you cannot rely on me and this is no more that logotherapy which I founded and I want it to be genuine and clear and proper, my logotherapy, and do not want these developments. And then came the split. So we separated and we founded the Society of Existential Analysis, GLA, Logotherapy and Existential Analysis. We had this society, but without him as a honorary president, and we developed existential analysis in that way as it is now. Aside of Frankl, Frankl told at that splitting up that he knows me, he knows that this work is certainly a good work, he read it partially, partially it, he, it was told to him, so he is convinced that this is a good work, but it is no longer his logotherapy, and therefore he wants a split that people who look for, for Frankl get Franklin logotherapy, and people who look just for other accesses to existential themes, they can come to existential analysis. And then when he died, I was asked by that editor, book editor, in where most books of Franklin appeared, people in Munich, to write a biography. And I said, no, I will not do that. And they pressed me and pressed me and pressed me. Then I said, OK, I go into a retreat and I give you an answer in a month. And I did go into a retreat, really not knowing if I'm doing that or not. And in that silence, I felt I should do it like a last contribution to our friendship. And to write a book on him on the level, on a personal level, in the form of an encounter. And I even had deeply inside the feeling that he wants me to do so. And there was something, he gave me a, a manuscript in which he described many situations of his life, personal life, professional life, reflections on himself. And he gave it to me and said, you are the only one who has that. 
Who has that? And the beginning of this manuscript was, whoever is going to write about me may make use of it, but only after my death. When we split up, he asked all the books back which I had of him, but not this manuscript. And I know that he knew that. Later on, I heard that after the split, he also gave this manuscript to some other people, like his uh, son-in-law. He also had it. But at that time, he said, you are the only one who has it. So I didn't know. And I almost forgot it after the years after the splitting. And so I wrote that book, and it was an immense self-experience. And I, was, I knew I will write that book only if I am in peace with him, if I have forgiven. And I, I knew him so well, I could understand him, although I am deeply convinced that he did not justice to me, to our relationship, and in the same sense, to him. A couple years ago, I met his daughter by chance in Vienna on the street. And my, his daughter told me he was against this splitting up. But there was a reunion with about 20 to 30 logotherapists from all over the world. And they pressed him to do that. And he said, no, I don't see any reason. Langley does not treat me in unjustly. But after a while, his daughter told me, he said, OK, if you all agree and if you all want that, then, in the name of God, I will do it. His wife told me about two years or three years ago, we had an encounter. She told me this was the greatest pain in his, in his last decades. And he asked everybody to never mention my name because he couldn't bear it. This is the tragedy in it. But he was great enough to tell me in the splitting, don't be sad. This gives you back your freedom. You can develop really freely. You never don't have to cite me as psychoanalysts do. Uh, Frank Freud must be cited in every publication. No, you can write and do f totally freely. This is a great chance. You are freed by this. This is your side which you should consider. And this is also Frankl. Empathizing and having compassion and looking for the best meaning for the other person. Also, he did something really ugly, I would say. And it made me suffer a lot. But I'm in peace. He, he stepped over himself. Now I know it. I always had the feeling that he didn't correspond to himself. But he, he let himself force to do something for which he did not have agreement, approval. He had a weak point when other people exert pressure on him, then it was difficult for him to withhold. <laughs>